the mm. Jewish community is saying in terms of our priorities, the freedom for abortion is first, the freedom for LGBTQ is first, all kinds of freedoms come ahead of religious observance. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thank you for joining us. We have an important interview for you today with guest legal expert Nathan Lewin. But before we start, I want to encourage everyone to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. Now to today's program. In the wake of a series of U.S. Supreme Court decisions in defense of religious freedom, including two delivered at the conclusion of the historic session that ended in June, some of those groups, which purport to speak for American Jewry, are alarmed. Along with that of their secular liberal allies, the advice of the Anti-Defamation League and the American Jewish Committee was rejected by the court in Carson v. Macon and Kennedy v. Bremerton. In both, the court argued that the clause of the First Amendment, which guarantees the free exercise of religion, ensured that the state could not discriminate against the expression or practice of faith. While the Constitution forbade the specific establishment of a state religion, by 6-3 majorities in both cases, the court upheld the notion that religious liberty was not merely protected by the Constitution, but was given priority as truly our first freedom. Why then do liberal Jewish organizations oppose the defense of religious liberty? The answer is rooted in one of the key elements of the growing division in our politics between left and right, as well as in the Jewish community's troubled past. That was on display in the dismay of the ADL and the AJC, as well as other liberal and left-wing Jewish groups. Their opposition to the decisions in these and other religious freedom decisions can be summed up in one word fear. Liberal Jews fear that if, as in Carson, the state isn't allowed to discriminate against parents who send their children to religious schools by denying them benefits given to everyone else, that will mean that the monopoly of secular public schools on government support will be threatened, and thus inevitably create a situation in Jews will be discriminated against. The decision in Kennedy was even more disturbing to them because the court refused to discriminate against religious speech. It concerned a high school football coach named Joseph Kennedy, who kneeled on the 50-yard line after games for a moment of silent prayer. Since some of the athletes and students present would volunteer to join him, the school district treated it as a violation of the separation between church and state and let the coach go. He sued, and the Supreme Court said he was right. As Justice Neil Gorsuch correctly summarized the issue in the majority opinion, religious beliefs and religious expression are too precious to be either proscribed or prescribed by the state. What was at stake in the case was not compulsory school prayer, which was ruled unconstitutional by the court in 1962. Rather, as Gorsuch stated, here, a government entity sought to punish an individual for engaging in a brief quiet, personal religious observance. Yet the ADL and the AJC thought the punishment appropriate since they termed even voluntary silent prayer to be inherently coercive and therefore a a threat to minority students. The Constitution prioritizes the right of religious expression. It did so because the founders understood that history teaches that suppression of religious dissent is an essential element of tyranny. In their day, it was the fear of one religion banning another. In the 20th century, murderous totalitarian Marxist regimes declared war on all religions, except their own idolatrous secular faith. In contemporary America, it is the new secular woke faith about race, 
that seeks to silence dissent. Why then are Jews so afraid of protecting religious expression? As a religious minority that has suffered discrimination and prescription in other lands, you would think the Jews would be the first to stand up for the rights of people of faith who are being silenced. But so great is this liberal Jewish fear of non-Jewish faith that organizations like the ADL and the AJC seek to sweep the public square of clean of all signs of religion, a position that would have left the founders incredulous. Jews have thrived in America in a way that was unmatched in the long history of the diaspora, and at the core of the safety and acceptance that they found here was the fact that no faith was established by the, as the official state religion. But to many Jews, fear of faith in the public square has led them to see the Constitution's sensible balance between non-establishment and defensive free exercise as worrisome. In the 20th century, politically liberal Jews who saw the issue solely through the prism of past fears were part of a movement that sought to rid the public domain of religion. Yet that hasn't made them safer or freer. While liberal Jewish groups remain obsessed with a non-existent threat to Jewish rights from religious Christians, who are now more likely to be philo-Semitic than hostile to Jews, they are blind to other more pertinent dangers. The woke left, which is now ascendant in academia and exerting increasingly greater control over public school curricula, is hostile to Judaism and expressions of Jewish identity because they see it as an expression of white privilege. Liberal Jewish groups who have gone along with the toxic myths of critical race theory and intersectionality in order to avoid being called racist are now therefore complicit with a cultural trend that is endangering Jews while simultaneously supporting efforts to repress religious expression, whether it took the form of a silent football prayer or the erection of a Hanukkah menorahs on public property that those who are tasked with the job of defending Jews against discrimination are lining up with those who seek to discriminate against faith is more than ironic. Their extremist separationist position has also caused them to oppose reasonable school choice programs that would aid religious schools that are essential to the survival of Jewish communities in America. Jews have always been equal citizens rather than a tolerated minority here. As George Washington said in his 1790 letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, in America, all possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. The government of the United States, he went on, gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Those great words apply just as much to the right of non-Jews to pray or live religious lives in public as it did to the protection of Jews. How sad that Jewish groups that are lining up with those seeking to brutally repress religious expression haven't learned that important lesson. And now to our interview. Our guest, Nathan Lewin, has been at the forefront of litigation on church-state issues for decades. Nathan Lewin clerked for Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan, then became assistant Solicitor General and argued 12 cases in the Supreme Court. He then served for one year in the State Department and returned to the Justice Department as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division. He was a founding partner of Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin, which has three alumni now on the Supreme Court. He argued 16 Supreme Court, Supreme Court cases while in private practice, including representation of former President Richard Nixon. He has represented Jewish freedom of religion causes in the Supreme Court and in the courts across the country and wrote the provision amending the Civil Rights Act to require accommodation to private employment to religious observance. He's now in practice with his daughter, Eliza Lewin. They briefed and argued twice in the Supreme Court in the Zivotofsky case, where the Supreme Court held that the president has the exclusive power to recognize foreign sovereigns, therefore enabling President Trump to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Nathan Lewin, welcome to Top Story. Thank you. Very pleased to be here. I'm a, a devoted follower of uh, JNS and your podcasts, and I'm really very pleased to be here and to be talking to you. 
Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's an honor for us to have you. I want to start by asking you, as someone who has been immersed in cases concerning church-state separation, to explain uh, to our audience just how much the law was and wasn't changed by recent Supreme Court decisions that were decided in the most recent historic <clears throat> term ended in June, especially Kennedy versus Bremerton and Macon versus Carson. Uh, for decades, the standard to adjudicate the line permissible of between what was permissible involvement between the state with religion was something called the Lemon Law. What exactly was that? What changed? And why did that change? All right. I may say something which will surprise you, but okay. I think... That, Good. I, I like to be surprised. Go ahead. Uh, I think that although there's been a lot of publicity about how what the Supreme Court has done has substantially changed the uh, application of the First Amendment protections for religion, I think that they have been changed far, far less than the public appearance of it uh, has projected. You have to realize the first 16 words of the First Amendment are, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So that's two things. You can't establish a religion and you can't prohibit the free exercise. And in those days, in the 70s and 80s, the court was totally taken by the establishment clause. And unfortunately, the secular Jewish organizations, the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, all of them were equally concerned that there were going to be violations of the Establishment Clause. And the Supreme Court struck down as unconstitutional various forms of financial assistance to church-related institutions. The court, not long thereafter, had second thoughts. And they overruled some of those terrible decisions. But when those decisions were really issued, the court was in the throes of an anti-establishment uh, uh, drive, really. Everything could violate the establishment clause. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish organization said, oh, that's right. We don't want this to be a Christian country. We're afraid our students in the public schools are going to be proselytized and they become Christian. <clears throat> so the court took that position. It was rejected. And as the court changed over the years, it realized that the Establishment Clause <clears throat> was too readily applied to invalidate laws that should be considered constitutional. We've reached a stage now with six justices, I think, on the Supreme Court who view the free exercise clause as being important. But again, my view is not important enough. They haven't done what they should do to promote and preserve the free exercise of religion. Everybody is applauding and, you know, pointing to the fact that uh, a football coach uh, was entitled to kneel and pray on the 50-yard line. That, to me, is uh, piddling. That's not important. And the court has had the opportunity in the past couple of terms to do things that would really make a difference in terms of religious observance. But the cases the court has taken and decided, I think, are really empty uh, uh, acknowledgments that while well, maybe free exercise of religion is more important than we recognized in the past. And the unfortunate thing is that American Jewish groups like the ADL and Jewish lawyers like those with the ACLU have criticized these very small I think quite insignificant steps that the court has taken. I yeah, was a that's, that's really my next question. 
Um, you have been involved um, in cases uh, famously, uh, including efforts um, by Chabad to place Hanukkah menorahs in public spaces. These efforts were vigorously opposed, uh, as much if not more, by liberal Jews who believe the safety of the Jewish community lies in a very high wall of separation between church and state. They're very afraid of establishment. They fear the presence of faith in the public square. While the fears that underlie those assumptions may have made sense in other eras or in other places where Jews had good reason to be afraid of religious expression, why do you think the bulk of Jewish opinion, of liberal Jewish opinion, which is the majority of, of most Jews, and major groups like the ADL, like the AJ Committee, are still so committed to these positions? Well, I think, first of all, I think it is the historical reluctance to observe, uh, to uh, retreat or move away from decisions that they've taken in the past. I'm astounded that there are still ACLU lawyers and anti-ADL lawyers and AJC lawyers who say, and they've said it recently, and I think Abe Foxman said it recently, the public school system was so good for American Jews, it endangers the public school system to have a decision like the Kennedy versus Bremerton decision in which a, a coach could kneel on the 50 yard line. The public school system may have been good and useful for American Jews years ago when uh, uh, the concern was that maybe the teachers would be devout Christians and would try to turn the Jewish students into Christians. That was the concern when I was growing up. I heard it all the time. My God, the Jewish kids are going to be forced to pray. If they're forced to pray, the teacher is going to invoke Christ, and the Jewish students will think that they have to be Christian. I wish that the teachers in the public schools today were religious. The problem is the teachers in the public schools are progressive. Religion today is viewed as a hobby. It's viewed as something that's, oh, if you decide you want to be religious, you might as well decide you want to be a New York Yankee fan. You might as well decide that you want to wear uh, uh, you know, whatever kind of clothing is in, in vogue today. But the progressives don't think religion is important. When uh, Scalia issued his infamous decision, I was involved in drafting and supporting the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Believe it or not, Larry Tribe, who is now the dean of the progressives, the Harvard Law School pro professor, was a part of the draftsman committee that drafted the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And he said it's constitutional to put religion at a very high place, higher than Scalia had done, and to restore Sherbert versus Werner. That was his opinion back when the law was enacted. The uh, Congress enacted that law almost unanimously. But now the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is viewed as endangering LGBTQ. It's viewed as endangering- Because it's protecting the rights of religious Christians who dissent about great gay marriage. Uh or uh, Whereas, or abortion. It should, it should be clear, unfashionable causes. It should be clear that religious people, whether they are, uh, there's a case coming up to the Supreme Court now involving the designer, a web designer, who refused to design a web for a same-sex marriage. To me, that's that case should be open and shut. Why not? say to the same sex couple, go and find another web designer. Usually they can, but no, now doing that, like baking a cake 
and like putting flowers together as a flower. Other, other controversial cases that have been uh, right. And that's viewed as a public accommodation, and you've denied, you've denied for religious reasons the right of someone to engage in a same-sex marriage. Now, I'm not denying it. The web designer didn't deny it. The web designer simply said, don't put me in the position where I have to participate in. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act should give them that right, unquestionably. And yet the court has sidestepped that. Justice Kennedy, who unfortunately joined Scalia in that terrible opinion, and then years later wrote the decision that held of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the national, the uh, state, to the extent that applied to the states, was unconstitutional. Justice Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, has uh, essentially, in that instance of the religious observer, sidestepped and issued a very narrow opinion in the case of the baker, rather than recognizing the baker's right not to participate for religious reasons in a same-sex marriage. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's very interesting because these debates go to the heart of constitutional arguments about religion. Uh, recently, Linda Greenhouse, the longtime New York Times Supreme Court correspondent, wrote a piece in the Times in which she mocked and condemned Justice Alito for what she said is a doctrine that gives the right of religious expression a higher priority than other forms of expression or societal goals like gay marriage or, or, or free contraception. Certainly most Jews fall into the category of political liberals and are not comfortable with conservative Christian dissent on issues like that. Um, but I guess the question is why should Jews, what, you know, it's like, what is the case to be made for Jews because they disagree with these people politically, uh, why won't they join in the defense of their uh, right of religious expression, considering that Jews themselves have been discriminated against? Um, shouldn't Jews identify with religious minorities like this? I think they should, but unfortunately, it reflects the fact that today's Jewish community in America, as the polls and studies show, are not inclined to place religion at a high uh, uh, place in their priorities. Jews, too many Jews in the United States, including people I know who are totally committed to Orthodox observance, say, oh, I'm going to vote on the basis of the fact that the Supreme Court outlawed, uh, overruled Roe versus Wade. And abortion is now going to be prohibited in the United States. Is abortion really more important, the right to abortion, than the right to religious observance? And yet, that's what is coming out of the Jewish community. The mm -hmm. Jewish community is saying, in terms of our priorities, the freedom for abortion is first. The freedom for LGBTQ is first all kinds of freedoms come ahead of religious observance. Now, I think that's frankly uh, a, a, a degrading Judaism. I mean, we have existed for 3000 years because whether one observed or not, the Jews had a common religious bond. And I think we continue to have that religious bond and we continue to have it to Israel and to Jerusalem. That's part of the problem today that mm -hmm. Jews in the United States say, well, OK, we're here in this country and Israel is doing some terrible things and we have to oppose them. A, Israel is not doing terrible things, but B, even if you thought so, nonetheless, as a member of a people that's existed for 3,000 years, looking to return to Jerusalem and Israel, you have no business saying those who try to protect and defend it should be criticized. Yeah. 
I, I think that's exactly right. And I think that goes to the heart of this. I mean, um, the First Amendment, you know, free exercise, it is our first freedom, but uh, those who are unhappy um, with the court because of their feelings about abortion or gay rights uh, seem to wish to uh, deny that first freedom. I want to shift, you know, in, in the limited time we have, I want to shift topics slightly now and ask you, not so much about the law, but how our discussions about race and the law have changed. You were in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division in the 1960s, and among many other things, helped prosecute the murderers of the three civil rights workers who were killed in Mississippi. Uh, but the ground has greatly shifted since then, and ideas about equality and a colorblind society have gone out of fa favor in uh, in in favor, uh, out of fashion, in favor, and uh, have been replaced by ideas like intersectionality and critical race theory that want equity rather than equality. Uh, how dangerous is that for society? And in particular, how dangerous is that for Jews? I think it's very dangerous for Jews. I think I live and was, I was unfortunate enough to be born in Poland and my three of my grandparents were murdered in the Shoah. So I had no grandparents when I came to, we came to the United States. My mother's mother arrived there years after the war. She had been in the Dutch East Indies during the war. So I had no grandparents essentially. But when I grew up, the country was becoming really meritocracy interested. I managed to make it to Harvard Law School, not because of any influence, not because I came from any particular uh, address, but because I did well in school and did well on the LSAT. So they gave me all the opportunities. And because I had those opportunities, I managed to succeed at the Harvard Law School. I managed to go on to clerk on the Supreme Court. I joined the office of the Solicitor General, and I felt very strongly with the Kennedy administration that we have to go and grant full civil rights regardless of race. And, you know, what Justice Roberts has said, uh, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but if you want to eliminate discrimination based on race, the easiest way is to eliminate discrimination based on race. And, and yet that's exactly what uh, the people calling for equity uh, are do, want to do. They want to discriminate on the basis of race. Right. And so now I read, whereas I went, I mean, I wrote what were at the time very aggressive briefs when I was in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, arguing for Black rights in the South, voting rights, rights to education. They were viewed so aggressively that when Nixon was elected, the man who was Solicitor General and wanted to stay on as Solicitor General, Erwin Griswold, went in to the Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division. And I heard him say, because I was the deputy and the door was open. And he said, you know, there are briefs that we filed in the former administration. This was in Lyndon Johnson administration in the Supreme Court, very aggressive, very liberal, written by Nat Lewin and Louis Claiborne. You want to look at this very closely before we file it in the Supreme Court. I was viewed as somebody who was aggressively arguing for black citizens and their equal rights. And yet I'm appalled at what is going on today when in fact what was done against on the basis of race against black citizens is now being done against Jews. Much more difficult to get into the Harvard Law School today because the Harvard <laughs> Law School now wants to accept people on the basis of race. You can't do that. If you're gonna eliminate a race conscious society, eliminate discrimination based on race. And yet, very short-sightedly, 
Harvard has said, oh no, we want to get more blacks into the class. And therefore, we won't take as many Asians, even if the Asians are better and do better on the tests and make better grades. And that case may involve Asians, but I can tell you it also involves Jews, white Jews. They are now being discriminated against in admission to the Harvard, Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. And of course, uh, critical race theory uh, basically labels Jew, Judaism Jews as, as white and therefore white privileged and therefore an oppressor it labels Israel as an oppressor in that same way. And that leads to discrimination against Jews in, in academic settings now. Um, and uh, sort of in the former administration, the Trump administration sought to intervene um, in, in these cases, the Department of Education, the Biden administration seems more reluctant to do so. Um, that's an important case uh, that these are important issues now. Um, how important is it? And, and yet, you know, many liberal Jews argue, well, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, you know, the, they, they worry more about, um, you know, sort of suppressing uh, the right of, of people to discriminate against Jews than for the right of Jews. That's absolutely right. And that's what is happening in the universities. I mean, it's now become really very risky to send your child to a leading university because if, if your child shows any Jewish identification of any kind, whether wearing a yarmulke or a Mogan David uh, a necklace or a Jewish star of some kind, they're going to be discriminated against not only by faculty, and there are very many aggressive faculty members, and I have followed that, my daughter has followed that, but by other students, student groups now opposed to Israel, supposedly supporting Palestinian rights, have been discriminating against Jewish students in the leading universities. It's outrageous. I read it in the newspapers every day, and I'm outraged. This is not the America that I grew up in. Yeah, uh, very true. Um, Nathan, we, had, we don't have that much time. Um, but I wanted to ask you just conclusion. You've been involved in many different interesting cases. You've represented some very famous people. Um, you helped prosecute Jimmy Hoffa as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, who, who were the most outstanding personalities what, what, you know, that you can recall having to, to represent? And what did you learn about them that surprised you? Um, what's, what's, what are some of your strongest memories? Well, I have strong memories, certainly. Uh, Chabad, I have, from years and years ago, uh, although I am not myself a Hasid of Lubavitch, I felt, as my father, Zakhar Lavrocha, did, that Chabad was doing a lot of very fine work and that the Rebbe was really a leading uh, light in terms of jury and worldwide jury. So, you know, my representation of Lubavitch in the Supreme Court and in many other cases, it's not just the Supreme Court case, but there were a number of cases in courts of appeals and in district courts involving menorahs. So the meetings I had, obviously, with the Rebbe were very memorable. But I also, I represented Richard Nixon. Uh, and the funny thing about Richard Nixon was what a partner of mine noted. When you spoke to Richard Nixon, you had a feeling he was an actor acting as Richard Nixon. You never had a person, a feeling when I talked to him, and I had a number of conversations, not as many as Jack Miller, my partner, had with him, but I argued with Miller his case in the Supreme Court of the United States. So I had a number of conversations. And every time I talked to him, I thought, oh, this is some guy who's acting like Richard Nixon acts. I, I never got a feeling of a real person. Uh, you know, there, there were other people, and I represented Ed Meese, who I have a lot of respect for. He Former was a, Attorney General, yeah. Uh, and, and I must say, it's really interesting to compare 
how when I represented Ed Meese in an investigation by an independent counsel, we followed the rules down to the very last jot and tittle. I mean, he was subpoenaed to testify in a grand jury and appeared twice all by himself before a grand jury to answer questions. That's not the way Hillary Clinton was treated when there were questions about her. They asked her to come in with their lawyers and they'd have an informal conversation. Nobody thought remotely, let's subpoena Hillary Clinton and have her testify in the grand jury. But Ed Meese did, and he was exonerated. Ultimately, after a very painstaking investigation, the independent counsel had to acknowledge that there was no basis for the criminal charge against him. So he was, you know, the the one client I represented who people all the time have asked me, how was he? Did you, was he interesting? Did you talk to him as a client who I never met, although he's well known? And that was John Lennon, his immigration lawyer who lost his case before the immigration board took the case to the Court of Appeals. And since he did not, was not familiar with how to handle a case in the Court of Appeals, he asked me to represent John Lennon. And I did. And I wrote a brief and I argued the case and we won the case in the Court of Appeals. And I had a check for my services signed by John Lennon. I probably would have been smarter never to have deposited the check because it today would be worth an awful lot on the auction market. But I did deposit. But when people ask me, how was John Lennon? I have to admit, I never met John Lennon, even though I represented him. Okay, well, that's great. Well, uh, that's certainly a, a very interesting array from 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 uh, Rabbi Schneerson, the, the, the you know the, <laughs> the Lubavitch Rebbe to uh, to the Beatles. That that's that uh, to Richard Nixon. That that that's a pretty broad uh, scope of clients. Um, uh, Nathan, I want to thank you uh, before we run out of time. Um, it's been great speaking with you. We'll have to have you back sometime to talk even in more detail about some of these cases as they come up and uh, the uh, as the law changes or, as you pointed out, doesn't change all that much. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for inviting me, and I'm very happy to uh, have this opportunity to express what is probably a very much of a minority opinion about what the Supreme Court has accomplished this past term and the term before in the area of religious freedom. Thank well, you. Uh, our, our liberal, uh, our liberal uh, Jewish friends, that their fears and their alarm uh, don't don't uh, don't go along with that. But um, that that was a really interesting perspective. Thanks very much. We also want to thank our audience. Whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, please keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.